I'm so grateful to Ned and to the center for the last 18 years for all that I've learned and experienced. Uh, I, I can't begin to describe it. I would like, though, today to acknowledge, to acknowledge my debt my intellectual debt to Roman, and other debt to Roman Friedman. Um, and the overlap between my own work and Roman's, again, I don't need to describe that, will become apparent as I start with my presentation. Um, you know, um, I'm not going to talk so much about what economics should do in the future, but how it should think about how people think about their own futures. And to start, I will wind back to a beautiful paper of Phelps and Pollock of 1968. And I think this is a great paper for, for three reasons. Um, the, this uh, extrapolates, extends Ramsey's 1928 paper to consider the, uh, the uh, time periods here represent different generations. So C0 is how much the current generation consumes. Beta shows how much they discount. The current generation discounts the imagined future generations. In Ramsey's view, it was morally indefensible to have a beta anything different from one. But the Phelps Pollock paper explores what if preferences are not like that, what, what ensues. And you, you already start to see here in 68 some early, so the, the uh, a phenomena of Ned's research of bringing psychological realism into economic models because the future generations are not going to be perceived the same way the current generation is. So I think that's the first great thing. The second is that they solved the um, dynamic programming problem and were able to show um, how much the uh, long run savings rate would be, assuming that future generations be, uh, perceived their own um, circumstances the same way the current generation would, and um, established that savings would be lower to the extent that uh, that future was discounted. And I think the third brilliant thing here was they stopped at this point. They didn't they could have said, well, we're going to extend not only Ramsey, but we're going to extend Samuelson's 37 paper and try to uh, model the consumption function of the individual within their own mind and see the, the future consumptions as an individual playing a game with their future selves wishing to see, well, at the few, I'm going to discount my future selves, and those future selves will, will, will feel a certain way about their future selves. And within an own mind, with, with, you know, and I, I think that, that it was great discipline to stop there. It's not a discipline that others showed later on. So a literature developed using the so-called beta-delta notation of Phelps and Pollock but applied at the level of, an, of the individual. And there I think um, th that's where some of this literature started to turn wrong. Uh, when we think about this as future selves, if we're very, very careful about parameterizing the belt, delta and the beta and the um, uh, marginal elasticity of substitution, you can get this purple line to show with, perfect, with a, an individual living for 50 years engaged in the dynamic game with themselves, that they'll consume relatively stable amount and it will trail off at the end. But two points to be made about this. First of all, if this is an individual, it is oh so sensitive to the parameters. Uh, if, the, if the human psychology turns out to be any different from these numbers here, you trail off into something wildly unbelievable. Um, and there's a paper that goes with this talk where I, I go into that in a bit more detail. Another fundamental problem with trying to model individuals this way is that there needs to be a one and only one natural time frame with which people think about the current, the present is one year, 
and then the future that I don't care about starts in two years. If, that, if that's the way it works in years, it can't work that way in months. So we have to be endowed with this unique psychology. For generations, it's plausible, one generation, another generation. But for individual trying to navigate the, the, the time forward with themselves, there is no natural time frame that, that, that I know of. And that's, that's a defect that's been swept under the rug. And if we have, uh, the, and the only way to get it work is to have a very little elasticity of substitution and to have a high interest rate and a low discount rate. And if we use uh, you know, very plausible assumptions, the future in 50 years will be discounted by a factor of 3,000. But uh, these numbers don't appear in the literature. You know, in the modeling of individuals, this is, uh, this is just, my, I, I'm just tackling the easier case, Roman, with perfect certainty, of allocating their consumption through their lives. You know, if a demon were to come to, uh, to a person and say, here are the different paths that you could have. In A, you consume this much this year, this much next year. Pick once and for all. You can choose A, you can choose B and C. A rational person would be able to say which they wanted. And those preferences would presumably be, be transitive. That would be a hallmark of rationality. And this is a demon that enforces the path that they choose, never comes back for an opportunity to renegotiate. It's just a once and for all decision. Now, if we add to that a commitment to paternalism, that we want to make those paths come true. At this moment in time, we want that ranking to be the most likely outcomes to manifest themselves in the world. I think that's kind of a funny assumption. We care about our future selves, but only in the way that we feel about them right now, not what they might want to do in the future. If we start from the point of view of paternalism, if we say that that's, that's a hallmark of rationality, and we discount the, uh, at this moment in time, we discount the uh, welfare of future selves, Unless that discounting is geometric in discrete time or exponential in continuous time, and we have paternalism, so we want to enforce it, we end up with what Strutz 1955 called an intertemporal tussle. We're always uh, fighting with those future selves. We're tussling with them. They won't cooperate with the plan that we have for them at this moment. So either we try to adopt a second best solution or we try to uh, adopt devices that will make them do our bidding of the current, the current person. Um, so if we have geometric discounting, we get out of the problem, if that's what people do. Now, first problem I would raise, you know, this was introduced by Samuelson in 37, and just as Samuelson, when he talked about efficient markets, said we should be careful about this, when he introduced uh, time consistency with paternalism and, and geometric discounting, he said there, there's serious limitations, almost certainly uh, vitiated from a theoretical point of view. In the first place, it's completely arbitrary to assume that the individual behaves so as to maximize the integral of the form envisaged. Okay, so he was much more modest about it than, than how it's become the universal way to adopt the consumer's problem in contemporary economics. And Strutz in 55 said, you know, there's no, said, made a similar comment that there's no reason to think that uh, the telescope of Professor Pigou, that's you, a telescope, you look at it from the wrong side. So you look at your future and it becomes more distant. And they said, there's no reason to think that that's going to be log linear in the distance from the object that's viewed. Um, so it would be peculiar if the human brain was endowed with the one and only one function for thinking about its future that happened to lead to time consistency. Um, and you know, it also would mean that when you're thinking in discrete time, there is a single unit of time as well. The analyst doesn't have to know, but the individual has to know. And if you're thinking, if you have control of yourself in units of days, well, you discount tomorrow by 0 0.9998 if you want to have a 5% 95% discount rate for one year. And if you get that wrong just a little bit, you discount it by 0.988, then a year from now, it's 65% discounted. So again, it would be very very odd that we happen to be that way. Another, reinforce, another reason to think that, the, that this model is, uh, is suspect is 
Estimating the discount rate itself has been uh, notoriously difficult. You know, uh, and looking at a meta-analysis, uh, rates are between, discount factors are between zero and annualized and one and 106%. And there's no central tendency. It doesn't change whether the study is later or earlier in the future from the 70s up to the present. It doesn't matter if rewards are real or hypothetical, if it's experimental or if it's in the field. They vary with the time horizon, and uh, the, the, the estimated discount rate doesn't correlate with the person's behavior. They may save diligently for their retirement and smoke cigarettes. Uh, so there's just, it fails every empirical test that it comes up against. Um, and I uh, maybe you won't, uh, this isn't the moment to review it here, but uh, if you adopt the, uh, the hedonic principle of, of Jevons, you can come up with an even more, an even deeper problem with this notion of multiple selves as the way that people uh, think about their futures. And um, find, contra if a person looks more than one period ahead, there'll be inevitable contradictions. It's a matter of logic. It's the way here, it's the way people in distant planets would behave if this is the way that they would always have a dysfunctional relationship with time, wanting to get off the path that seems best for them if they base the decision today about what to do, about what, what do I, what, how do I enjoy the current moment and how do I enjoy anticipating the future. All that's going to change when the, uh, if I look at the perspective of period two to period three will change once period two turns into the present. It's a, it's a, it's a, a longer article than is probably a, a appropriate um, to discuss here, but I, I'll point you to the paper, which is posted on, on the website. Um, you know, I, I believe that the, the discussion of commitment devices, which are a, a staple of any economics textbook or behavioral economics, if people do try to commit their future selves, they're engaged in this intertemporal tussle. So it would be a signifier of dysfunction over time. So if there are, if, if commitment devices are an important part of the way that, that we uh, live our lives, then, then I think that would uh, go against my thesis here. But I'd say on the contrary that, that they have very little to do with the way that, that, we, that we live. Um, I, I won't go through them one by one, but if you take the example of, of Odysseus, the, the most famous example where he had his sailors tie him to the mast and then put wax in their ears so he could hear the siren song and not swim to them to his, uh, to his death, you know, he was pre-committing himself not to jump off the mask. But he was just anticipating a future loss of reason when he would hear the siren song. We can go through these examples one by one and find that they all anticipate some temporary loss of judgment or ability to make a sound decision, and that's rationally anticipated. One more that I find uh, fascinating is everybody's heard about Christmas clubs. They, they appear in every discussion of hyperbolic discounting and time and and show why we, why we can't uh, negotiate time correctly. The myth that economists tell, or some economists tell, is that, well, people um, needed to uh, lack the self-control to be able to save to buy Christmas presents during the year, so they would, they would commit themselves to a Christmas club where they would have to, to, to put a certain amount of money in, and they couldn't take it out without a severe penalty. So then they would have a smooth path towards saving and then spend it at Christmas time. The problem with that myth is it just isn't true. If we go back to look at the heyday of Christmas clubs in 1927, a very nice paper by Cosgrove at the time said that banks lost money on their Christmas club accounts, that it was an introductory banking product for people who hadn't encountered banks before. It was an attempt to draw them in. They had a mismatch between when they earned the money throughout the year and when they needed to spend it. There were not big early withdrawal penalties, and most of them, contrary to the mythology, did pay interest. They faded away. They only caught on in the United States and Canada. So I think it's unlikely that only Americans and Canadians have self-control problems. If that was the problem it was solving, it would happen all over the world. And they're mostly gone. So I also think it's unlikely that we've mastered our, if we, we used to have self-control problems, and now we've mastered them, so we don't need Christmas clubs anymore. Um, so, I kind of have a conspiracy theory about talking about commitment devices as if they're a major thing. You know, but when, so 
I want to propose as an alternative to um, the discounting of the welfare of, future, of imagined future selves, um, when people think about their consumption and their investment decisions, that they are spontaneous acts of will. That people engage in a challenge uh, when they make an investment, that, they, uh, that consumption decisions are made on the spur of the moment after people have a, a baseline um, subsistence level of, of consumption. And um, that uh, we could make room for, that we can bring back, I would argue on behalf of bringing back a Keynesian type consumption function. Now, the first thing that would come to mind, and actually I, uh, this, this weighed on me also, is, well, if somebody is choosing randomly, then they're not going to be a very effective kind of person. Maybe a good person who gets by in the world, has a survival advantage, ought to plan out their future. They ought to be maximizing something. If you're not maximizing something, you're going to lose, maybe you're going to lose your way. So I undertake an investigation with my wonderful student, Zhu Tian Wang, who's here today, to explore this hypothesis. So we pitted the Keynesian consumer who is here against the consumer we call the Merton agent, who consumes according to the permanent income hypothesis and invests according to the Merton model. And I'm even rigging this in favor of the Merton consumer. He knows all the parameters, just to give him the benefit of the doubt. And see, OK, so they experience, um, they have a certain, they're endowed with a certain amount of wealth. They, ex it, uh, they experience a shock. And the Keynesian consumer consumes the subsistence amount plus some random portion of the amount of income that, if the income is positive, of the amount that he earns each year. And if he loses, he just consumes the, consistent, the subsistence amount. OK, so we have these, these two guys going at each other. The Merton uh, observing the permanent income hypothesis and investing optimally to maximize this integral of the person's consumption plus this term, uh, the, the Merton agent also cares about his bequest. The Keynesian agent doesn't. They just bequest whatever's left over at the end. OK, so what happens? Well, here's the, with a sort of what I consider a standard set of parameters of Judean and I have found in the literature. The red is the, the average consumption for each year from age 20 to age 70 of the, Mer of the Keynesian agent. The blue is the Merton agent. The Merton agent has much more stable consumption. The Keynesian has more volatile consumption, but the Keynesian agent doesn't care because they, they're not, they don't have um, concave utility functions that they're, that they're maximizing. Um, but I find it quite interesting to see that uh, you know, if we look at different sets of parameters, here you know, I have pretty, the mu is the return to the risky asset. I let the return be pretty high because, you know, Maybe I'm thinking about the ancestral environment or, people, or people's, uh, all the opportunities they have to invest in education, to renovate their house, to buy a, a consumer durable. So there might be good investment opportunities besides dividing, uh, buying a diversified portfolio of stocks. And then the, um, in this table shows the, the, the total lifetime consumption plus bequest of the Keynesian minus the Martin. So Keynesian does better than the Merton agent, except when the returns to the risky asset are very high, then the, Kane, the, the optimizing agent shifts into the, um, the risky asset and then gets a lot of consumption towards the end. So uh, here you can see it graphically. This is the Merton agent. So it takes advantage of really great, stable investment opportunities. But I could easily tweak the Keynesian just to say when they're great investment opportunities, they just switch into it. And I don't know that that would be completely disruptive. The Keynesian model fits life cycle consumption better. You know, another problem with the permanent income hypothesis is it doesn't fit the data very well unless you do a lot to try to, you know, you can add habituation, liquidity cons uh, restraints, and add in more realism. But, you know, this naturally uh, fits the pattern that aggregate income tracks aggregate income, but not at the level of the individual. Because acts of will will even out across people. But if we fit this empirical, if, if we have 
sort of probability that someone is going to consume. They don't know whether they're going, it's not even known to the individual. It's not a probability in the sense that the analyst doesn't have enough information, but in the sense that there's a random number generator baked into the person's uh, decision making, which we, which I would like to call will. Um, it explains um, rising consumption through age 45. It, this, the Keynesian model doesn't easily explain why people start saving in middle age, but that, that could be baked into it. And uh, it also explains why people continue working beyond retirement age. There's a lot of realism that comes very naturally from fitting something empirically and not as a, not as a giving up. Not as saying, well, we can't fit an optimizing model, but to say, this is not the kind of thing that's mediated through a preference function, but this is something that people very basically decide on the spot as an act of, the, not because it's better than some other consumption plan, but just because that's what they want to do, that it's self-justifying. Um, so I would argue that the macroeconomist is that this is, you know, I'm not going to argue that my consumption function that I drew earlier is the best one. I, I'm sure it's not. But that estimating consumption functions like this is the sort of thing one ought to do. And it's reflecting human psychology as it exists. It's not a departure into behavioral economics or rationality from which one ought to be corrected. And it stands on it on at least a solid footing, or I would say more solid footing than the bankrupt notion of discounting future, the utility of future selves. So just to, just to review, the fact that people have a preferences because the demon comes and says you've got it, this is, this is your once and for all day, and you have to choose for the future, that you can make preferences there, doesn't mean that you live paternalistically at every moment trying to, to uh, assert your uh, authority over future selves. Um, and then, well, I, I, um, I won't repeat all of my, my, uh, my, my critique of the defects in the discounted utility model, but just to say that I find it comforting that none, that, uh, and it, it brought me over the, over the edge to believe that this is a way to do macroeconomics, to see that um, there's not a survival advantage to being an optimizer. It may even be the other way around, someone who's curious, who, uh, uh, who engages in, uh, in challenges and projects and is curious right up to the end, may create knowledge and uh, let, or, or go out in the ancestral environment, seize a water well, right? Uh, you know, and even if they're not going to be there to enjoy the full present, net present value of all the benefits, it creates a public good that would confer a survival advantage on their kin. I don't want to you know, embark on a sociobiology uh, bio explanation, but the sociobiology of this wouldn't be bad, I would imagine. So just to sum up, you know, it was said not that long ago that the Keynesian consumption function has not been taken seriously since the work of Friedman and Modigliani in the 1950s. Um, I think it's time to take it very seriously again, not as a giving up on maximization, not as a departure into behavioral economics, but again, to, to repeat what Roman said, as the way that Keynes intended it, as a spontaneous urge to action. Um, and um, so it's really a Phelpsian consumption function expressed as Keynes would have done. And then uh, my project would be to estimate that empirically and to say, but yes, this is, the, this is the best we can do and the best we're ever going to do because we can't model human will. So that's, that's my talk. We have time for a question or two. Richard, really great work, um, particularly for somebody coming from Cambridge. Uh, oh. <laughs> but I do, want to, I do want to put in a little caveat around the sociology of economics with respect to metaphorical Christmas clubs. Mm -hmm. This is a phenomenon observable on the down east coast of Maine, and I'm told in other parts of this country as well, where people who do work during the summer season refuse to submit bills until the end of the year, not because they are 
in fact, implementing a Christmas club, it's because they have a lot of relatives, a lot of relatives. And as soon as income dries up after Labor Day, they really want to protect their income, their ability to spend out of their income before they're surrounded by their relatives asserting uh, prior claims. <laughs> Oh, okay, I, that could be another good example for me because my, it's not a self-control problem. It's actually, I could, yeah, I, let's talk about that later because I can add that to my list of examples of things that look like commitment devices but really aren't. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, Bruce. Yeah, is there a social dimension to this determination of consumption behavior? And if there is, and we just heard it in Down East Maine, are there significant differences in consumption behavior across countries and within countries? Bruce, I think that's a splendid question, which I do not know the answer to. <laughs> I'm just going to pass on that one. <laughs> national differences, including language and how language affects discounting. So there's a huge literature on that. I'd be happy to send you some stuff. I don't think discounting is a thing. <laughs> Ned's going to say something. Does the, the desire for self-expression come in here? Yeah. I, I didn't use that term of self-expression, of self-actualization. All those things are right in here. And I want to represent them in, in an equation, but to, take the, to treat this randomness as, you know, on average, people are going to, going to try stuff out, and they'll make an investment, they'll make a consumption decision. And I want to set the stage for it by saying, the stuff we have, the thing we have right now that we equate to reality, uh, to, to, to rationality, I, I think is quite, quite broken and it's famous for being famous. I mean, it, I, I started in my paper to look at the percentages of macro papers that start out with this in continuous or discrete time. It's basically 100%. Um, I don't even think it's a point that needs to be proven. But I'm arguing instead, go from this to this, and this has self, this has will, self-expression, uh, uh, embracing authentic challenges, um, consumption and investment decisions that are for itself, that are not undertaken because they're better than some other decision, but just, just because. And that's what I'm trying to capture here. Roman. John Kay had a, John Kay had a wonderful piece once in the FT called Obliquity. And I don't know if you remember that piece. Yes. And in the second paragraph, he said that no one was ever buried with an adage that they maximize profits because even exposed, it wasn't clear that they did. Which is so. If you add the element of uncertainty as opposed to probabilistic uncertainty to this, then of course there needs to be an element of what you would want to call will. Yes. Keynes would call sentiment or chance, but these are all the same concepts. They have to do with, right. Yeah. Or, or even animal spirits, which you know is a much deeper uh, concept than being made out to think that people lose their mind and engage in bubbles. You know. do, do you have a nutshell definition of will and will. maybe do you have a bottle of some potion that Look, can increase will? Yeah, there's, there's a, uh, an unsolvable contradiction to trying to maximize expression of will because then that just reduces you back to making a robotic calculation that no longer can exercise genuine agency. We call them economic agents, but they have no agency at all. They're just controlled by their preferences, which they're endowed with. And the worst of all is utilitarianism, where they don't even get to be endowed with their own preferences. They just have to They maximize these 10 things or, or 13 things. I, I've forgotten the number, uh, which, is, which is the most degraded notion of ourselves that you can imagine. Yes? 
social aspects of economic decisions in a funny way come into this individual decisions because they this looks like an individual decision, but it's really a decision, there's a complex decision between the way you understand the environment, the way you understand yourself, yep. the way you understand where you want to be in the future, the way you understand where you want your society to be in the future. All of this is wrapped in into this. Thank you. Yeah. And also Catherine is, I think, one, one more. Yeah, I think there's one more question. This is very interesting to me, and uh, I can't help thinking, and I'm just curious whether uh, I'm struck by how reminiscent this is of Joan Robinson's criticism of the economic mainstream. Uh, uh, and I wonder if there's any, uh, I mean, of course, she was a student of Keynes's and, uh, you know, early advocate of the Keynesian theory, but had her own view. Uh, is there any of that in your yeah. thinking? Okay. Yeah, thank you for asking that. I would like to say that I am, I see myself uh, as, as neither a defender of the faith nor a new atheist. And, and I think that there are many decisions that uh, economics nails, like consumer demand, a lot of labor, some labor decisions, program evaluation. I mean, I, uh, with maybe one or two exceptions, I'm probably the most orthodox person in terms of economics in the room. Uh, it's just some of it. I think because it can help us understand a lot of the world, it doesn't mean it can understand everything. I'm not here to attack. I'm not, I'm not here to attack the whole thing. I'm just here to attack this. And um, so, but thank you for helping me clarify that. You know, I guess we've run out. I just want to say in closing, I want to thank, once again, thank Zhu Tian for helping me do this, which was a ton of work and was very persuasive to me. So that's it.